Hey there, it is Friday. Another week for us at Reactive, diving into learning, diving into all things um, neurological um, and surviving during this crazy time in our world. I am Julie Hirschberg. I am the owner of Reactive Physical Therapy and Wellness. We have two practices in the Los Angeles area here with a focus on physical therapy, occupational therapy, yoga therapy, and a lot of wellness these days, a lot of exercise education uh, for people with neurologic disorders. As a part of that, we run a fellowship program for physical therapists who specialize in movement disorders. And as a part of that fellowship, we do monthly education seminars. And we've been doing these for four years now. And um, we've been doing them online for a couple of years. And we just did one last night um, on one of my favorite topics, which was functional movement disorders. And today we're going to chat a little bit about uh, what we talked about, just a little recap, share some of the nuggets. Uh, I think many of you know this is a really passionate area of, um, of mine. I am really crazy about the brain and all things, uh, all things neuro. Um, but I think especially when it comes to some of the more rare disorders, misunderstood diagnoses, and um, functional movement disorders is one of those. Um, you know, on average, people go a long time, at least a year before getting a diagnosis, and they go through so many different providers with misinformation and people telling them they're crazy or it's in their head. And it's just really unnecessary, uh, necessary suffering, I would say. Um, and this is one of the reasons why this topic is, is really dear to me and why educating providers is so important to me so that we can help people. So um, we, this is our um, second annual update on functional movement disorders. Chelsea Richardson and I uh, did our course last night. You can still catch it recorded if you're interested in that. And we did a lot of updating. Now we did this course, <clears throat> excuse me, last year. And then uh, we did a presentation at CSM. Uh, just back in February, and we already have so many new pieces of evidence and information that's out there. So it's just constantly changing. It's a topic that we talk a lot about here on our Facebook Lives because it's rapidly changing, and we're just so passionate about advocating for good information about this disorder. So we made lots of updates. And one of the things I want to hit on are um, the understanding of the diagnosis and the pathophysiology. We're going to talk key some of the key treatment principles that drive neuroplasticity. And then share with you some of the things that we've learned from our complicated cases. So um, let's let's dive in. Let's talk diagnosis and pathophysiology first. And I'm going to make sure that you can see this in our in the camera here. So I developed really a new um, a, a new way of uh, explanation of the disorder. Um, this was really for myself to kind of bring together several other um, uh, diagrams, explanations, pathophysiology, reading through a lot of the historical literature into the present of lifestyle factors, cognitive factors, physical factors that play into a potential diagnosis, and all the overlaps that is with neuroscience and pain neuroscience to put it into one description. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about it um, because I was pretty excited about this. Um, and this started with some excitement with um, Janine Holmberg's work in 3PD. And she has a, a diagram that helps explain 3PD and put something similar here for all of functional disorders. So I want to tell you a little bit 
about this and pulling from this literature. So if we think first about their, this first yellow box is kind of there's an initial event or maybe even an accumulation of several events or predisposing factors, which are um, really, you can see a lot of these out in the literature. Predisposing factors like physical injury could be one, um, physical or emotional trauma, sleep deprivation, a dizziness event, a panic attack, all of these things could be that initial event. And then most people, and Janine cited this in her diagram as well, 70% of people after that dizziness event will actually have an ad adaptation and, you know, go into recovery, um, making reconnections, regaining control, um, and, and, and moving on and not having that dizziness control their lives. However, um, in the dizziness world, 30% um, of people may not go down that path. And why is that? And it turns out in the literature, there are indeed reasons why. And so if we adapt this to functional neurologic disorders, we can look at what are some of those predisposing factors that we know in the literature, we see them um, clinically as well, may then lead the adaptation pathway to go to a maladaptive neuroplasticity, lead to functional neurologic uh, disorder, lead to impaired sense of self-agency, over-awareness and vigilance, and cortical distortions or smudging of the sensory cortex. What are some of those factors? And these come out in the literature. Comorbid factors um, like immune system disease, genetic factors, even having a neurologic disease, lifestyle factors like diet, sleep, um, uh, deconditioning as big ones, psychosocial factors, so film, fear, illness perceptions, personality, um, being very isolated, which is just a huge problem for people right now, um, a heightened sympathetic system, feeling no control or autonomy. Now, these would all be things that may lead due to that more negative neuroplasticity. And these are all things then where we would directly come and help either refer or provide intervention. So then this, the, here's the good news and the hope for a functional neurologic disorder. Because you're here does not mean you can't get there. I think with the right therapy, the right resources, the right education, you can go from these symptoms into where, um, where, you know, in the vestibular world, 70% of the people do go to reconnection, control, and recovery. So last night we talked about this as setting up the framework for treatment and what we would do and how we would set up and understand some of these factors so that we can set up positive neuroplasticity. So that leads us to one more diagrams. I love my diagrams. I think you probably know that. Um, we put together um, from the literature a diagram that would hit on the big pieces of a treatment program, treatment journey that we would take with somebody with a functional disorder. So I won't go into a ton of detail here because it took us an, over an hour and a half last night to go through it. But um, I just want to hit on some of the big pieces. So going kind of in order, they don't have to be in order, but that first is the diagnosis, having a diagnosis, um, especially with a movement disorder specialist neurologist, the therapist's own understanding and confidence in that diagnosis, and a lot of listening and understanding. Um, this is where we did talk about having some of those enhanced expectancies, sharing videos of other people who have been through this diagnosis. The second is addressing some of those underlying factors or just ensuring that they have resolved. So, for example, if you've had a dizziness incident or a vestibular incident, actually seeing that it has resolved so that then you can be um, focused on, I see um, some kids coming in my background here. We have a new toy for spring break. Are you wanting to show me? <laughs> we are live on video here. Um, you can certainly come in. Arlie is showing um, 
their new little bubble suits um that we got she and her sister for spring break here it's been raining a ton so we just blew, blew them up today um and you know what this little bubble suit would be a great intervention i think it totally changes your sensory experience when you say arlie of how you're walking you have to walk a little different you got all this um this, uh different sensations oh Hey, it kind of looks like the world revolving behind me. Um, thank you very much for sharing. Um, and there you go. This is what's happening at our house um, during spring break while we're all at home. Um, so um, ensuring that a, an event has actually resolved and then, um, and then addressing some of those underlying issues. Was there a range of motion deficit, a strength deficit, an imbalance, neural tension, all of those pieces? And then these pieces are really the heart of what we're doing. Neuroplasticity optimization and that reconnection, restoration of normal attention and control. We talked last night, this was a really fun part because I dove all into a lot of the resources that I've gained in the mindfulness world for autonomic toning, um, grounding activities to reduce vigilance. We also talked about applying the optimal theory as a way to improve that connection for people and then graded exposure um, is, is especially in the world of motor control and in um, in the the person with dizziness and sensory training and reweighting, all part of that reconnection piece. So that really hits on the four pillars of treatment in the functional neurologic disorder. And um, and then finally, we applied this to some pretty complex cases. And one of those cases was a case that Chelsea and um, Kaylin, one of our other therapists, share of a person who um, had, and we were able to show that they had both 3PD and a functional gait disorder, met the diagnostic criteria for both of those. And you can you know sometimes these overlap and that can be really difficult and i think one of the biggest questions that people have is where where do i start and this you start by listening to your patient where do they need to start and that you know listening that's in the orange here listening is probably the biggest piece validating and understanding where they need to start they may need to start here in neuroplasticity optimization for autonomic activities and grounding activities because they can't progress the control without without um having their nervous system in a little bit more of a parasympathetic state um so we were chelsea was able to really beautifully describe that in our patient case um and then could show moving into a case where the person has both the 3pd and a functional gait disorder how you could progress the systematic exposure um with little successes, graded successes, graded exposure and success for both the 3PD and a functional gait at the same time. This is often what we are having to do, I would say, um, is do two things at once um, or address two big problems at once. So there you have it. Um, three big uh, neuro nuggets, I would say, from our course yesterday you know, understanding the the diagnosis and the pieces, um, the neuroplasticity pieces that go into play, looking at those key treatment principles and understanding where you start may be in any one of these places as you listen to your patient and being able to progress through complex, complex cases. So, um, we had a great time last night. We had a great group of people with some good questions and observations. Um, we're continuing on. So we've got our Learning Gone Viral um, courses that we've been doing for the last couple of weeks, which I've loved. And um, it's a great way to interact and stay up to date in a like really cost-effective way. 
we decided we're going to continue that. We've gotten such great feedback. So we're going to continue that on a monthly basis. So you can sign up uh, again in May, May 1st, if you want to join us for those. And it's going to be a really low cost, high value way to stay um, in touch and connected with a group of therapists, problem solve cases, get your questions answered, be exposed to new and different things. Um, so we'll be uh, launching that again May 1st for um, everybody. And um, if you're interested in any of our of our resources, I'll put a couple of links. Um, we use our river analogy. We talked about that last night. Um, that's something that you can download. I'll put that here. Uh, we're also, this is kind of a side note, we're just hosting a free um, webinar and dialogue tomorrow. Brittany Kim and I are. On what we're learning in telehealth, people have been asking us a lot of questions. And um, I think we all have a lot of questions. How do we do this in the virtual world? So we're gonna talk, how do you do the neuro exam? What about somebody that needs more physical assistance? What about the person that doesn't wanna get online with you? What are, what are we doing and what are you doing? And together I think we'll be able to um, feel really confident um, in applying our skills in a new way, in a virtual way. So that'll be tomorrow morning. I'll post the link if you want to sign up for that. Um, that'll be at 8.30 Saturday morning if you want to join us for it. Um, I'll post a couple links to articles, too, that I um, really love that are free full text and great references for you for functional movement disorders. And then I will see you next week. Thanks so much for being a really great community to connect with. Uh, during this time. It's just really a bright light for me. And I appreciate it so much. Have a great weekend.